Hey, I'm Willie George, and I'm very glad you joined me today on the Faith Roots Podcast. We're talking about trials. Nobody likes trials. Nobody likes temptations. We uh, see them as extremely negative. However, if you approach trials and temptations with the right attitude and with superior knowledge, you can actually use them to flip the script on the evil one. You actually wind up gaining ground. And we're going to get into that in this entire series. It may take me to the very end to fully get it across. But one of the first things you have to see is that if you live for Christ, have Him in your heart, you live on this earth, you are going to be continually contradicted because Jesus was. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, you will deal with all kinds of contradictions. You will set out to do something and it'll be contradicted, or you will say something and it'll be contradicted. And you begin to wonder, what's wrong with me? And if you're not careful, you forget that Jesus himself was continually contradicted by people, and not only by people, by the elements themselves. So what we need to do then, when the Scripture says consider, that means to sit down, take a careful look at, and to contemplate. That's what we do. We look at Jesus, and we don't just say, okay, he got victory over the devil. No, we're to contemplate that. How did he do it? What did he do? Uh, Can we do the same thing? Is there something that he did that we cannot do? And when it comes to temptation, there is absolutely nothing that Christ did that you and I cannot do. Now, if we're called to do something that only Christ could do, then that's really not fair and we can't overcome. But there's nothing when it comes to temptation that Jesus did that we cannot follow exactly. And so that's why it's important to learn exactly how he responded. He responded to the contradictions that came against him. He he responded to them with Scripture. He didn't get involved personally. He did not attack the devil with name-calling. He didn't get into it with, I'm greater than you, didn't say any of that stuff. He always answered with the authority of Scripture. That is something that you and I do. If if we were to boast of how great we are, whatever, it wouldn't amount to anything with Satan. That's why we don't follow that. We follow the teaching of Scripture and what the Scripture says. And when you speak, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, that you are speaking the Word, and it becomes the sword of the Spirit. Now, I want you to imagine what would happen if you went to go harass somebody, knocked on their door, and they opened it up very quickly and had a razor-sharp, two-edged sword to use against you. You wouldn't stand on the porch very long. And the same thing is true of the devil. Uh, He doesn't stay for long when you know how to wield that two-edged sword. So we're going to look at that very carefully here. Now, here's what we need to realize. We're not in temptations alone. We have a helper. Jesus said there is another helper who is going to come to you after I leave, and that is the Holy Spirit. And the word another helper, uh, or those two words, mean another of the same kind. He's going to be just like Jesus. Jesus showed them what to do. The Holy Spirit will show you what to do in a time of temptation. He will show you what to say. And this is so good. Uh, it, it, it is something I learned almost immediately after I came to Christ. In a time of temptation, I learned how to rely on the Holy Spirit to help me. Let me tell you a little story. I, I had been uh, uh, living with my father for about three to four years. I had lived with my mother, and then I lived with the both of them together when I was younger. Uh, But I had a choice as to which household I would live in. Uh, Well, I naturally chose my father because my mother had fallen into alcoholism and became unbearable to live with. And so for a number of years, everything was going good. But I came to Christ. 
I gave my heart to Jesus, and I started going to church, and I had a terrible alcohol problem even as a teenager. And you know what's crazy? I had seen that same thing in my mom, and I hated it, and the very thing that I hated, I was becoming, and I didn't even realize it. See, that's the deceitfulness of sin. And so uh, I gave my heart to Christ, started going to church, and I guess I'd been saved about three to four weeks. And I was getting ready to go to a revival one night. What is even in my church? It was in a friend's church just a few miles away from where we lived. Now, my church was 21 miles away, and it was my grandparents' church, my mother's parents. And I had attended there some when I was a little kid. I felt drawn to go back there after I gave my heart to Christ, and it was perfect for me. And, and I'll tell you why. I had a rebellion problem, and I rebelled against all kinds of adults, and these these older people took me under their wing, and me being with them and feeling their approval, it healed my relationship with grown-ups. That's exactly what God did, and it was on purpose that He was putting me here. Now, my dad came in and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm getting ready to go to church. He said, no, you're not. And I was shocked. My dad never stopped me from doing anything. I mean, never. I did three and four hundred mile trips. My dad didn't stop it. Uh, I uh, sold an electric guitar and the guy decided he didn't want to buy it. He lived 350 miles away. I drove up to that town and back from that town in one day. My dad did not stop it. My dad didn't stop anything that I did. I would come in drinking. He had to know it because I was falling into the house when I came in the door. And Dad never said a word. Now he's telling me I can't go to church. And by the way, my grades have just jumped through the roof now that I don't drink anymore, now that I'm not uh, 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 running around causing all kinds of trouble. I'm getting all my homework. I'm turning in every assignment. So my grades went up. Everything improved. And Dad said I can't go to church. I said, why, Dad? He said, I don't want you going to that church. Uh, my dad had some fears that my mother uh, was the way that she was because of the church she'd belonged to as a kid. And they were totally unfounded. This was a work of the enemy to break me and to stop me from going to church. And so I said, if that's the way it is, I can't live here, Dad. And I, th I shouldn't have done this. This was a little dishonoring. But I threw down the car keys into the floor and walked out the door. Well, it was raining cats and dogs. And when I walked outside, I thought, oh, brother, what a terrible night not to have a car. So I hitchhiked. And it took me about two hours to the church because I knew the pastor lived right next door in Little Parsonage. And so I knocked on his door. He came to the door. I told him what had happened. He really didn't know what to do. I don't think he dealt with kids like me very often. And he was careful not to give some kind of counsel or advice that might create a, a big fight with my dad. And so he prayed for me. And so I didn't know what to do. I went back out in the rain. And as I was hitchhiking back, now I've got to go all the way back to um, uh, where I came from. It's going to take me another two hours to get there. This is what the Holy Spirit brought to me. And I just read this. It, it, I had seen it in the Bible just a day or two before. And it talks about the apostles. And it says, They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. They were beaten and told never again to preach the gospel. Now, that stood out to me, and I'll tell you why. They did something good, but they were rewarded evil for it. And this is what so surprised me as a 17-year-old kid. I was shocked that my dad wouldn't be happy that I was going to church. I got more flack for going to church than I did for throwing wild parties. I mean, just the previous New Year's Eve, this one, or first part of March and New Year's Eve, I had a big party at the house, and Dad didn't know it. He came home early and caught us all. Never said a word. Never said anything. So I'm shocked that he has uh, a beef against me going to church like this. And I didn't realize what it was until quite some time later. But the Holy Spirit gave me a word that helped me to realize God was on my side, that I was counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. The Lord didn't tell me, go home and, and do everything He tells you. I had the choice to live with Dad or Mom, 
that night, I made the decision to go to my mom's. And as I was hitchhiking back, I found her house. And uh, she let me in, told her what had happened. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, I had the freedom to go to church. No car, no money, but I did have the freedom to go to church. I'm going to tell you what it did. It opened up a door for my mother's brother, who was a pastor, to step in and have me come live with him. And he changed my life. Put me through Bible school, trained me for ministry. And you know what it did? It healed my relationship with my dad. I would have had great conflict had I continued to stay with dad. Dad was about to remarry. In fact, the idea for me not to go to church actually didn't originate with my dad. It came from the woman he was about to marry. She was the one who put the idea into his head. And so I didn't need to be there. And you know what? Over time, over many years, Dad saw that it was the best thing, and he knew that it was the best thing. I knew that it was the best thing for him and my stepmother. I, I, I often rejoice that God gave him a woman in this stage of his life to be a blessing to him. So you see, it all worked out for the good. Now, <clears throat> people who do not walk closely with Christ are susceptible to demonic powers and evil spirits. Listen to what the Scripture says. doesn't mean they're demon-possessed. But they can yield to these things, say things they shouldn't say, say cutting things that cut you right to the heart. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. When people don't see the truth of God's Word, when they don't see the gospel, the Bible says they are blinded by the God of this world. And they can be blinded to the point of opposition. Now, I, I need to read this story to you because I, I want to show you how easy it is for this to happen. Uh, Jesus is talking to His disciples he took them to Caesarea Philippi, and he asked this question, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, Peter stepped up in a minute, and he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now this is Matthew 16, 17. So here Peter yields to the Holy Spirit, he is used by the Holy Spirit. God has revealed to him from the Father, through the Holy Spirit, that this is indeed the Messiah. It took people a little while to come to that. At first they thought Jesus was just a great teacher. Then they began to see, no, He is the Son of God. Now, after this, the Bible says from that time, verse 21, that Jesus began to show His disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now pay attention to this. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far from it, Lord. Far from, uh, be it far from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, Jesus didn't call Peter Satan, but he knew that the influence that caused Peter to say, you don't have to go to the cross, Jesus knew that that had come directly from Satan. So just a few minutes before, Peter had been used by God to say to Jesus, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. He yielded to the Holy Spirit. But the same man, just a few moments later, tells Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. And, and he actually rebuked Jesus when he said it. Now who in the world is Peter to rebuke Jesus? And this shows you this uh, lack of respect, lack of honor, and this direct contradiction to Christ didn't come from Peter's own mind. It was a thought that was planted in him. And without thinking, Peter yielded to it. That's what happens with a lot of people. A lot of people are so prone to letting things come from their mouths that immediately come into their minds. They feel like they have to get it out. And if you're impetuous like that and you say things like that, you're going to hurt people. And you will sometimes say things that are not inspired by God but are inspired of the enemy. 
That's why the Bible says in the book of James, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, meaning you need to watch what you say because you may speak something that absolutely crushes somebody else, is used by the enemy to totally destroy somebody else. I've done it myself. Didn't mean to do it, only later realized I should never have said that. I put a stumbling block in somebody's path. And so that's why it's important that we learn about these influences that are out there in this earth, the God of this world who wants to hinder and contradict the plan of God for our lives. He's there. We, we don't worry about Him. We don't dwell on Him. But our relationship with God is not the only relationship we have. We have a relationship with humans, and we also have a relationship with the devil. We have to learn to deal with all three entities, and that's what it means to walk with God. Well, that's all the time I have for today, but we're not done. We'll pick up here tomorrow. See you then.